In this video, we'll look at some of the worst cards from the first two sets of the game. A time period in Yu-Gi-Oh that has some of the most broken cards ever printed, as well as some of the most terrible. And at number 10, we have Harpy Lady Sisters. This is a level 6 monster with 1950 attack, and simply has the effect, where it must be special summoned with the effect of the Elegant Egotist card, and can't be normal summoned or sent. Luckily, Elegant Egotist is actually a good card, as it has the effect where if you control a Harpy Lady on the field, you can special summon another Harpy Lady or Harpy Lady Sisters from your hand or deck. So, if you're able to get a Harpy Lady on the field, then you can use Elegant Egotist in order to special summon Harpy Lady Sisters directly from your deck, and for being a card that you can get out of your deck, 1950 in stats is not half bad. Especially when one of the strongest level 4 monsters in the game at the time was La Jin, the mystical genie of the lamp, which only had 1800 attack. However, there were a couple of problems with Harpy Lady Sisters that contributed to the card never seeing any competitive play, despite the fact that it could be cheated out of the deck. One of those was that Harpy Lady herself is pretty weak for a level 4 monster at only 1300 attack, and Elegant Egotist was unsearchable at the time. So the combo in order to pull off Harpy Lady into Harpy Lady Sisters was just not a consistent one, and since Harpy Lady Sisters has the detriment where it can't be summoned in other ways, it was basically a dead card in your hand unless you could specifically get out one named card in the field and had another named card in your hand to activate. Generally, cards which require two card combos in order to bring out that have no good ways to search out either of those combo pieces are not very consistent, which is why the next cards also failed for having a similar detriment with their unsearchable next card. However, there was support released later on that allowed you to search out Elegant Egotist, and Harpy Ladies as an archetype evolved to the point where almost all of their main deck monsters have an effect to change their name to Harpy Lady while on the field. So with being able to actually search out Elegant Egotist pretty easily, and being able to fulfill the condition to use the card easier, Harpy Lady Sisters still didn't see any competitive play, because it was better to just bring out another Harpy Lady than Harpy Lady Sisters. Because Harpy Lady Sisters still had the detriment, where it was a dead card in your hand if you drew into it, and wasn't really better than just going into one of the plethora of other Harpy Lady monsters, where you'd usually bring out Harpy Lady 1 or Cyber Harpy Lady. Which is funny because there's a lot of really good Harpy support that specifically requires a level 5 or higher Harpy Lady monster on the field to gain their extra effects. And even then, they still won't use Harpy Lady Sisters, because it's easier to go into their Synchro monster instead by just playing all their level 4 Harpy Lady monsters. So, even though they specifically created support that basically forced people to use Harpy Lady Sisters, that still didn't pan out. So it never saw any competitive play back in the day, and not in modern Harpy Lady decks either. And yet this card is still the best card on this list by a mile, which is why it's only at the number 10 spot. And at number 9, we have Fusionist. This is a level 3 fusion monster with 900 attack and 700 defense, which is important to mention because its total stats is actually less than the total stats of one of its materials. In order to bring out Fusionist normally, you have to use Polymerization plus Petite Angel and Mystic Sheep number 2. So already you have to go minus 2 in card advantage to hard bring this card out. However, if you look at Mystic Sheep number 2, it has 800 attack and 1000 defense. If you add those two values together and compare those to the values of Fusionist added together, it actually has 200 more stats total. The only advantage you have for going into Fusionist is that Fusionist has 100 more attack, which is still really bad at only 900 baseline. And this wasn't exactly uncommon for early fusion monsters. There's three others that also have stats lower than one of their materials added up. It's just Fusionist is the weakest of all of them, and was in one of the first two sets, so it makes it in this video. There's a reason no one really played fusion monsters in the early days of the game. You had to inherently go minus two in order to bring one out, because the only fusion spell card was Polymerization. To the point where there were special rules in the rulebook dedicated to showing how Polymerization worked. So because of that, they didn't actually print the effect on the card in the first printing of Polymerization, and none of the fusion monsters were really worth going into anyway, because they were overly balanced, because they thought being able to special summon a monster from the extra deck was just too good. And honestly, they were completely right about that, if you look at the modern metagame that is 90% dedicated around the extra deck. Although, they were a little bit too weak, and Fusionist is kind of the poster child of that bunch. Fusionist did see competitive play later on in its life as an instant fusion target, and because it was one of the few level 3 fusion monsters in the game, and a lot of old school vanilla fusion monsters saw play because they just had the perfect type or level and were instant fusion targets, like Kaminari attack. 
But in the context of old Yu-Gi-Oh! and the classic sets, Fusionist was a pretty bad card. Especially if you remember that La Jin was the strongest normal summon in the game, which had 1800 attack. Which really puts Fusionist's 900 attack into perspective about how bad that actually was. And at number 8, we have Blast Juggler. This is a level 3 monster with only 800 attack, which has the effect that if this card has managed to stay alive face up on your side of the field until your next standby phase, you can offer this card as a tribute to select and destroy two face up monsters that have 1000 or less attack. So, being able to tribute itself to destroy two monsters is not half bad. It's actually a plus one in card advantage. The problem with the cards are pretty obvious, but I'll spell them out for you. The card itself is very weak, and trying to protect this card for a full turn in order to use it on your next turn is really not worth the effort of only destroying two low attack monsters. Generally, priority targets are high attack monsters because it's rather easy to beat over monsters with 1000 or less attack. Unless it was something like Spirit Reaper at the time, which was one of the few battle immune monsters in the early game. Although, in the early sets alongside Blast Juggler, we also had cards like Dark Hole, Raigeki, and Mirror Force, which could destroy all of your opponent's monsters, regardless of their attack point value. And these three cards were powerful, each one of them being banned or limited at some point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. But early Yu-Gi-Oh also had Fissure and Trap Hole, two other cards that could trade evenly one for one in much better value. The Trap Hole worked on monsters with 1,000 or more attacks, so it was actually pretty good. The complete reversal of Blast Juggler. And there were other monsters which could actually destroy other monsters in the game at the time, with Man Eater Bug probably being one of the most famous examples. So I guess they thought the effect on a monster would be too strong, so they heavily limited it with Blast Juggler. Although they went kind of crazy with the spell and trap cards because Dark Hole and Raigeki saw play all the way into the modern era, only really falling into favor once a Lightning Storm was printed. And at number 7, we have Electric Lizard. This is a level 3 monster with 850 attack, so another really low attack point monster, which has the effect that if a non-zombie type monster attacks Electric Lizard, it cannot attack on its following turn. So basically, it has the effect to die to one opponent's monster attack, and then allow that monster to not attack on its next turn, which is technically a positive effect. Although generally, if you're going to be playing a really weak monster like Electric Lizard, you kind of want it to provide more than just stalling out one attack from one monster on the subsequent turn. And it was also funny how it didn't work on zombie type monsters. This is kind of a theme for early Yu-Gi-Oh cards where there were certain types of monsters that had resistances to certain types of effects. Like how Steel Scorpion didn't work on machine type monsters, for example. But Electric Liz's effect was technically positive and did proc if it was attacked face down even. So technically, it could be used in a deck as a form of stalling. If your opponent destroyed it with one of their high priority target monsters anyway. Although, it may surprise you to hear this, but this card actually never saw any competitive play. And at number 6, we have Pump King, the King of Ghosts. This is a level 6 monster with 1800 attack, which has the effect that if a specific name card is face up on the field, it gains 100 attack and defense. And then, as long as that specific monster stays on the field, it will gain another 100 attack and defense during each of your standby phases for 4 turns. So that's a really convoluted way of saying that this card gains 500 attack if you have the Castle of Dark Illusions on the field. Which means after 5 turns, for the low, low price of a tribute summon and having a specific name monster on the field before it hits the field, you get a monster that's almost as strong as a summoned skull, which was the best tribute summon in the same time period, that just had a default 2500 attack on a level 6 monster. However, it could be boosted even further through the effect of Castle of Dark Illusions, as that card had the effect that if it was flipped face up, you got to increase the attack and defense of all zombie type monsters in the field by 200 points. And then again during each of your standby phases for 4 turns afterwards. And since Pump King the King of Ghosts is zombie, it can benefit from the effects of Castle of Dark Illusions and gain an additional 800 attack after 4 turns. If you manage to bring out Pump King before the first standby phase after that card was flipped face up, which was technically possible with Ultimate Offering. However, it wasn't really worth playing Pump King the King of Ghosts for a multitude of reasons. For one, it has the same problem as Harpy Lady Sisters, in that you need a nearly unsearchable specific monster on your side of the field first before you can use it. But, it isn't even special summoned from the deck like Harpy Lady Sisters is, as you still have to go through the effort of tribute summoning the card normally. And it has no inherent protection, so it dies very easily to the plethora of good spell and trap cards in the early era of the game. And also it takes forever to actually get to a good attack point value, 
where even back in old school Yu-Gi-Oh, taking 5 turns to almost get a summon skull as stats was too long. If the card didn't require a specific card to be on the field to gain its attack boost, it would still be too slow of a card to play Yu-Gi-Oh. That's the reason they kind of abandon mechanics that take multiple turns to resolve, unless it's attached to a super good effect. And only gaining 100 attack and defense on a low statted high level monster is not a super good effect. And at number 5, we have Two Pronged Attack. This is a trap card which requires you to destroy two of your monsters in order to destroy one of your opponents, which is a straight minus two in card advantage, but in one of the worst possible ways. You see, this card requires you to get two monsters on the field first, which requires you to use resources in order to accomplish that in the first place. So unless you're using something like Scapegoat, you're going to lose a significant amount of advantage in order to meet the requirements of this card. Plus, all you're doing is destroying a single one of your opponent's monsters, and you're losing a card using the trap card for two-pronged attack in the first place. So, you lose three cards on your side of the field to trade for one of your opponents. And again, this card came out when we had stuff like Dark Hole, Mirror Force, and even Fissure, which was a straight one-for-one -one trade. The only advantage two-pronged attack had over Fissure was being able to select any monster you want, and of course being a trap card so it could be used to disrupt plays during your opponent's turn. But there wasn't really complicated plays to disrupt back in the day, and having to get two cards in the field first in order to even use it was kind of bad. The card would actually be better if it required you to discard two cards to use the effect instead of destroying two cards, because at least you don't have to dedicate resources to get those cards from your hand onto the field first. And at number 4 we have Tainted Wisdom. This is a level 3 monster with 1250 attack, so kind of low, but higher than a lot of the other cards in this list we've talked about so far. And what it does is if this attack position card is changed to face up defense position, you gain the wonderful effect of shuffling your deck. Now, the beneficial uses of shuffling your deck include nothing. There is no real reason to shuffle your deck, as you don't actually gain a mechanical benefit from doing it. It's just technically kind of a positive effect, although it could be detrimental if you have something on top of your deck that you put there yourself. Tainted Wisdom could have an effect to just once per turn shuffle your deck and it would still be bad. The fact that you have to specifically change its battle position in order to activate the effect is why it's on this list. Tainted Wisdom was also released alongside other cards with battle changing related effects, like Dream Clown, which for the same condition got to destroy one of your opponent's monsters, and Crass Clown, which had the reverse effect where if it was changed from defense position to attack position, you got to bounce one of your opponent's monsters. Both of these cards actually had good effects on their battle changing related effects, and saw competitive play in clown control decks, although they definitely did not include Tainted Wisdom, because the only positive thing about that card is the fact that it's technically a tour guide from the Underworld target as it's a level 3 fiend. And at number 3 we have Yado Karu. This is a level 4 monster with 900 attack and 1700 defense, which also has a battle position change in effect, where if this card is changed from attack position to phase up defense position, you can place any number of cards from your hand on the bottom of your deck in any order that you desire. Now, this is a purely detrimental effect, as it can allow you to go minus in card advantage for no effect, and also requires you to change the battle position of the card in the first place to even use it. So at least with Tainted Wisdom, you weren't actively screwing yourself over by activating the effect of shuffling your deck. But just losing cards from your hand back into your deck for no reason is just really bad. One of the worst cards in the game is Pot of Generosity, and that's because it's just a minus 3 in card advantage. And Yato Karu can allow you to go minus 5 in card advantage if you desire. And the only reason this card isn't the number one on this list is because it has 1700 defense. You see, the strongest level 4 monster at the time was La Jin, who could beat over Yato Karu in battle if you set the card first. However, the second strongest monsters only had 1700 attack, and La Jin, the Mystical Genie of the Lamp wasn't hitting the field all the time. Generally, you'd be facing a lot of the second strongest monsters, which Yato Karu could actually wall out. And being able to wall out monsters in order to live for one turn so that you can tribute the card in order to bring out something like Summon Skull was a viable strategy back in the day. And since its defense value was just high enough to maybe be useful, it's only at the number 3 spot on this list, since the top 2 spots were a lot more useless. And at number 2 we have Gate Guardian. This is a level 11 monster with a very high attack point value of 3750, which has the effect that basically details its summoning condition just like Harpy Lady Sisters, except is nowhere near as easy to summon, as you have to attribute 3 specific named monsters on your side of the field. And these three monsters are all level 7 monsters that can't bring themselves out easily. So it requires a whole bunch of resources to get those three cards on the field. 
And as I've explained earlier with Pump King the King of Ghosts and Harpy Lady Sisters, getting a single name specific monster on the field first in order to activate an effect is difficult. Getting three high level ones on the field is way harder. But to the benefit of Gate Guardian, its three materials are all actually good on their own. They all have an effect where if they're attacked by a monster, they can lower the attack of the monster to zero permanently, so they're basically guaranteed to get a destroy if they're attacked into. They can only use this effect once while they're facing on the field, but you only really have to use it once. And because its materials are technically useful level 7 monsters, Gate Guardian isn't at the number one on this list, because it's also one of the best targets for Zubababa General, who can use this card in order to gain 3750 attack. And at number one, we have Great Moth. This is a level 8 monster with 2600 attack, which has the effect that's basically just conditions on how the card can be summoned, just like Gate Guardian and Harpy Lady Sisters, where it can only be special summoned by tributing a Petite Moth on the fourth of your turns after Petite Moth has been equipped with the Cocoon of Evolution. Petite Moth is a level 1 normal monster with only 300 attack and 200 defense. That doesn't do anything on its own, and Cocoon of Evolution is a level 3 monster with 2000 defense, which can equip itself from your hand to a Petite Moth on your side of the field, where it grants its original attack and defense to that Petite Moth. Which means you can make Petite Moth's defense become 2000. And then you need to have Great Moth in your hand on your fourth turn, after just waiting around for Petite Moth being equipped with Cocoon of Evolution on the field. Now, there's a whole lot wrong with all of this. First of all, you can only equip Cocoon of Evolution to Petite Moth while it's phased up on the field, which means in order to activate it on your first turn in order to get the ball rolling, Petite Moth is going to have to be in an attack position with zero attack, since Cocoon of Evolution replaces its original attack with its own, which is zero. So, if you wanted to get Petite Moth on the field in defense position, in order to have 2000 defense with Cocoon of Evolution's effect, you'd have to protect it for a turn and put it in defense position, or special summon it with something like Monster Reborn in defense position. So at the get go, it's already kind of difficult to just set up the combo because it's ridiculously vulnerable. And then you also have to protect it for four turns, which as I've described in the Pumpkin King of Ghost sections, is a very difficult with how strong early spell and trap card removal was. And then, you need to have a Great Moth in your hand during the fourth turn after you equipped with Petite Moth and Cocoon of Evolution. Which means you need to have found a way to search it out by then, and can only be brought out on the fourth of your turns. So if it's the fifth of your turns after equipping it, then the effect is no longer live and you can't bring out Great Moth. And that's not even to mention the fact that Petite Moth and Cocoon of Evolution require named cards working with each other, which requires searching those cards out in order to get the combo started in the first place. Now there are two other cards that can be brought out on different turns, with Larva Moth probably being the worst of them all, because it has all of the same terrible conditions as Great Moth, but only has 500 attack, which actually makes this kind of one of the worst cards in the game period. Because not only is Larva Moth bad on its own, the fact that it requires all of the convoluted requirements of Great Moth in order to accomplish its bad stats is kind of hilariously bad. But at least you only need to wait two turns in order to bring out Larva Moth instead of four. And there's also a mega version called Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth, which can be brought out on the 6th turn or later with the same conditions as the other two cards. And at least Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth can be brought out on the 6th turn or later, instead of exactly on the 6th turn, like the previous two cards. However, Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth didn't come out until later, and wasn't actually released alongside the original 4 card package. So really, this spot should be just the whole archetype of the Petite Moth and the Cocoon of Evolution's evolutions. Because the whole system of how this works is just another example of them trying out mechanics of having cards wait around for a couple of turns before they realized the speed of the game was just too fast for these kinds of cards to ever properly resolve. And the cards that they brought out after all of that waiting around were just not worth the effort. Especially since they were essentially vanilla monsters that just acted as big beat sticks. Later on, they did try this mechanic again with the ultimate insect monsters, although that archetype failed for a different reason. But at least it was better than the Cocoon of Evolution mechanic. And also, as a side note, much later on they printed a trap card called Corrosive Scales, which basically gives an insect-type monster the effect that Great Moth was supposed to have from its anime appearance, of lowering the attack of your opponent's monsters. If the Moth had the effect of Corrosive Scales built into it baseline, it would still be bad and not worth being played because of the mechanic of Cocoon of Evolution. Although, they did release the spell card Cocoon of Ultra Evolution, which can allow you to cheat the card out directly from your deck, as kind of a way to finally let people play the card if they really wanted to in an actual duel. But even then, you're better off bringing out the reprinted Insect Queen card instead. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other bad classic cards they missed that should have definitely been on this list? 
Or do you have ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, I'd love to hear about those down in the comments.